Hey, yeah. Will, how are you? Great, how are you, Ezra? Good, I am doing well here on day seven of the DC smoking ban, and all my clothes smell like springtime. They smell like springtime? They do. Wow, that's nice. What does springtime smell like? A, uh, my, my, clothing, product? my clothing without any smoke on them. <laughs> yeah. Well, that yeah, it's uh, they banned it on the second, so mm -hmm. that people, uh, you know, in New Year's parties didn't have to. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, the police, the stormtroopers didn't have to invade bars while the ball was dropping. So, uh, so which to a liberal so like me is a shame. I think the stormtroopers are criminally underused in American yeah. society, and we need to stop being so squeamish with them. Generally, yeah, we need jackbooted thugs to you know get people to you know eat right, you know, uh, study their mathematics. That said, DC experience. did do it in a hardcore way. Unlike New York, unlike a lot of other areas, we didn't put it in during the springtime when it would be easier on everybody. We did it during the winter when it would be cold, when it would be unpleasant to go outside, right after New Year's. I mean, yeah. we really hit it so we could get the full nanny state potential of it uh, and get right, everybody right, to actually try and quit. And now, as much as it enrages me to, uh, you know, violate the property rights of uh, business owners to, uh, you know, allow people to associate on their uh, grounds, on any terms they find reasonable, it's still I've still uh, already gotten some of the benefit of it uh, because there is a great union of smokers. You know, the, really? the, it, yeah, it's, it's like the it's like the international smokers of the world. So when when you have when you get forced out by the uh, the, the jackboot of the state onto the sidewalk where you're forced to you know tremble and shiver in the uh, winter night. You bond with uh, other smokers, so uh, so so uh, you know unless the, the the state is able to somehow sort of diminish the uh, the, the entertaining social benefits of uh, uh, of uh, of complaining with other smokers on the sidewalk. I mean, I'm not sure. This is uh, why I don't get libertarians. Happen. All right, so here you have <laughs> the effects of the smoking ban. Okay, uh -huh. everybody we know, uh, at least who does blogging heads, Matt Iglesias, uh, Spencer yeah. Ackerman, who I think appears here sometimes, they're all trying to quit, and so far are doing a good job. Um, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, my clothes, as we talked about, smell like spring, mm -hmm. and you are getting to build the social capital. I mean, yeah. the number of positive effects from our jackbooted, our jackbooted ban on smoking are remarkable. Remarkable. It's well, the well, greatest I'm sunny, I'm just a sunny time. person. I'm a sunny person, and I don't think it's a positive effect that all of a sudden, uh, the, you know, that Matt and Ezra, or your Ezra, that Matt and Spencer. <laughs> Are all trying to quit just because the smoking ban uh, went into effect? Uh, that's uh, it. Seems like a really pernicious thing that people follow, make personal choices based on cues from the state. So the state, you know, there are, or the city, the municipality says, "Hey, you know what? Smoking inside bars is no longer okay." And then all of a sudden, you know, people everywhere just decide, you know, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what uh, you know Adrian Fenty says you know, because <laughs> that guy's a genius and he knows what's best for me, you know. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll stop smoking. Uh, there, there's uh, you know James Buchanan, one of my heroes, a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, wrote a, a, an essay uh, a while you back the on, on on no not James Buchanan the president. I think um, he does have a hero. lovely monument in Meridian Hill slash Malcolm, Malcolm X Park. Park. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you have, I think it says something like uh, he was a great man who strode across the law like a giant who strides across the mountain range. Yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah, like a giant striding across the mountaintops of the law. And that's what I think of when I think of James Buchanan. But the better James Buchanan, <laughs> James M. Buchanan, a professor of economics at George Mason University and a uh, Nobel Prize winner, wrote an essay within the last couple of years on the, you know, the scourge of parentalism, right? The, 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 mm -hmm. the people's desire for the state to keep them from doing things that they want to do anyway. Uh, and uh, and uh, our, our friend Julian uh, wrote a, a very nice essay in uh, Reason, uh, and I think July of last year uh, on Save Me From Myself on the, uh, on, the, on how horrible it is for people. And Julian, to unfortunately, is not quit. We should uh, say. Uh, no, Julian has not quit no. because he's a man, oh, he's got the courage of his conviction. He's a man of principle, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I was at Julian's house last night and we were smoking inside. <laughs> Can you, I mean, I, like smoking inside these days is, 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 is equivalent to, I don't know, something, something, something horrible like, you know, uh, uh, like killing all the Jews in, 1940, in, the, in the late 30s and 1940s. 
But all James I can say, Buchanan had yeah. it right but wrong. I mean, many times we are, we know, I mean, Matt Iglesias and Spencer and, and Summer and the others who have quit, they didn't think smoking is good for them. And Adrian Fenty said, we're not going to allow it in bars anymore. And they had a light bulb go off and said, my God, what, what have I been doing all this time? They thought it was bad for them. And yet they were smokers. They associated it with going to the bar. They knew they wouldn't be able to quit. They knew they wouldn't have the willpower. He has made it easier for them, as they would all tell you. I mean, many times we know we need to do th something. And yet mm -hmm. we are trapped into patterns and habits that make it, make it very, very hard to stop. You know, we've all known, you know, destructive relationships with the two people enable horrible, horrible habits in the other one. And um, well, then clearly what, the, what, what the Adrian did was survey he relationships the, and help people get out of their bad ones, right? Say it again. I'm sorry. But, you know, clearly, you know, that, you know, we ought to have uh, state financed marriage counselors who assess the quality of your relationship and, uh, you know, uh, you know, increase your taxes. Well, are they going to be unionized? If, if your marriages are bad or something like that. Because, yeah, the, the, the problem is, is that if they know that smoking is bad for them, then they need to take responsibility for themselves. They have to take responsibility for their own lives. They say, well, these bars, uh, you know, when I smoke is all around and, that's, and that makes it hard for me to quit, well, they have to take responsibility for where it is that they choose to go. If, if, if they like hearing music in smoky bars, they're going to have to say, hey, you know what, here's the decision I have to make. If I go to the smoky bar, I'm going to want to smoke. So, uh, so either I, and if I, I want to quit, maybe that's something that I'll have to sacrifice. Uh, part of taking responsibility for yourself is, is, is making uh, decisions that, that do have costs. You are on and every particular there, I think, correct, except mm -hmm. for the fact that the smoking ban has nevertheless had massive positive impact. Oftentimes, people do not. Uh, fully comport to, you know, the ideals that even they would set up for themselves. I'm sure, you know, Matt and so forth would say that he should have quit on his own, but, but it was harder to do. And given that the smoking was hurting, say, me, <laughs> and, and certainly making well, life much more pleasant. And that's really what it's about, isn't it? Indeed. It's, 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 a, it's about 20, 30-something yuppies who don't like to pay their dry cleaning bill. Right. And that's just an incredibly obnoxious and a sort of disgusting ground for restricting the liberty of property owners to have establishments in which people can do things that they approve of. Well, it's of. a little bit more than don't want to pay the dry cleaning. I mean, you do have such things as secondhand smoke, which I know libertarians tend to not believe in, but has nevertheless been pretty well. Whether or not you believe in it, it's still, again, like you can enter someone's property, you can enter their mm -hmm. establishment of business, or not. Uh, the, 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 you're under no obligation to go anywhere where there's smoke. And if you know that there's smoke there and you don't like the effects of secondhand smoke, you can stay away. And that's why the advocates of the smoking ban were claiming very disingenuously that it was about the health effects of workers on restaurants right. and bars. Uh, I mean, and, and the workers and the, and the waitresses and bartenders came out in droves to say, you know, one of the reasons I like to work in a bar is because I want to smoke on the job. But because but, it really is about, you know, uh, rich white kids who don't, uh, who need help not smoking and don't right. want to smell um, bad. My local waitress, and Helen, had to stop smoking and was has been twitching for two weeks now, but, but it's great. I mean, again, all that you say on many, many moral grounds is true. It is mm -hmm. largely about sort of affluent young yuppies, and it is, uh, it is something people should have been able to do on their own. And I'm actually not going to in any way attempt to justify it from first principle, where I don't really think it's terribly just. But that said, sometimes the outcome does outweigh the mean. Uh, the means, and here I think is certainly one of those cases where really hundreds and, and thousands of people around this city and certainly in California and New York and everywhere else have stopped doing something which is by all accounts unbelievably deleterious to their health, to their lungs, to their livelihood, something that is massively addictive. I mean, I watch my friends trying to quit, and, and so, mm -hmm. so do you here. Mm -hmm. And say what you will about the fact that they should have willpower and responsibility and mm -hmm. whatever else. What they got into, possibly at a party one day, is currently making them ill, they're going numb in their extremities. They're mm -hmm. twitching. They're aggravated. They're upset. They have pounding oh, and, headaches. And they're also and they're also all drama queens, you know, because we know well, these guys. Sure. Right. But the yeah. addictive the addictive nature of it is true. I mean, and look, I, I don't know how you put that into a political calculus, but it isn't mm -hmm. it isn't like fatty food. It isn't like the fact that people shouldn't eat cake possibly, mm -hmm. and so they should stop eating all the cake. I mean, it, it has a much, there's a much more stronger stickiness to smoking, which is certainly, um, you know, it is well, chemically that, and, and, composed that way from maximum activity by the And that's why the government likes to play it both ways, right? They like the, uh, 
they like the uh, uh, you know the inelasticity uh, of uh, consumption of cigarettes so that they can tax them and have a reliable tax base, and yet at the same time they try to get people to stop. But then if they get people to stop, they don't get as much money. Well, I think most of the would tell you would be happy to say that we should get rid. Of, we should have everybody stop smoking and just mm -hmm. raise a general marginal tax rates. Certainly, I <laughs> well, would. Let's, but I think let's we need to move on here, right? Well, yeah, this is, I mean, uh, it, you know, although it, whether or not you think the consequences are good depends on how you count up consequences, and, sure. and, and I think the loss of liberty uh, for people to uh, dispose of their private property and to associate with others on terms that are mutually agreeable is a, a very, very bad consequence. Uh, I think here's a little, uh, that, it, it, that particular loss of freedom is a small one, right. uh, but there are bigger ones, Indeed. and let's talk about one of those here for we a go. second. Uh, the, uh, Take I, it away, I, I Will. I wanted to just mention uh, there's a, uh, a fellow who goes by uh, Kareem Amer or Abdel Kareem Suleiman. Uh, who was arrested and interrogated by uh, prosecutors in Alexandria, uh, Alexandria uh, Egypt. Um, not Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, they don't do that so much in Virginia. Unless um, smoke. And, and, and he has been uh, in jail for over two months now. And, and, and what is his crime? Blogging. Blogging. Indeed. Blogging. And he, so you and I are bloggers, Ezra. Uh, and uh, we just absolutely take for granted the fact that uh, we can say whatever we like. We can say that uh, George Bush is a, uh, a, a, you know, a moral coward and an ignoramus and a, uh, you know, a total failure. And we do say those things mm -hmm. on a frequent basis. And but but we are at least free to do that. We we, we right. have no. There's no threat of reprisal. Uh, but here's a, a young man who has been arrested simply for blogging. Uh, and uh, and it's something that uh, you know the governments of the world, the Egyptian government, needs to know uh, isn't okay. So I just thought I would tell right. the uh, tell tell the uh, uh, viewers and listeners of Blogging Head TV uh, that there is going to be a uh, protest uh, at uh, uh, an Egyptian government building, whether the embassy or some other uh, building that they own, uh, in protest of their. Uh, uh, violation of uh, Abdul Karim's uh, natural right to express his opinion uh, sometime on Thursday, and that will uh, show up on uh, on a blog. Uh, let me tell you the name of it. It's uh, it's it's called uh, it's, it's DC Blog Free. Blogspot.com and viewers and should know our, our millions and millions of viewers out there in online land that that address will also appear on the right here, and there will be yeah. I, I assume more information about how to get involved, how to email, how to how to try yeah. to raise awareness about this. And we don't even and, we, and, we, and it doesn't even we don't even we're not hoping to have like some gigantic protest, right. but we just want to send some message that that uh, you know, and especially if you're a blogger or a, a lover of blogs, uh, you might want to. Uh, uh, express some solidarity for uh, a 22-year-old guy right. who's trying to make some comment about uh, the political situation in his culture and is just... No, uh, I mean, it, it is totally that crazy. I'm 22. I tried to do that. And the difference between living here and living there is that I've been able to make a living and an occupation and a life out of it. Many, many, many of my friends I've met through this medium. Um, I'm doing this because of this medium. And I've had, you know, said truly awful things about... Uh, the administration, which I would argue mm -hmm. much of many of them were deserved, and some of them probably were extreme, but at all at all times I've had, and you've had, and we've had full freedom to do that, and to more than that be rewarded for it. The idea that in other places it is an act of courage and can be punished is something that is a little tricky to wrap your mind around, but it certainly deserves yeah. our attention. So we take so we take it for granted, right. and, and so if you get a chance and you're free, I think it's going to be over lunchtime mm -hmm. on Thursday. Uh, check out the blog. There's also I think uh, free Kareem. Uh, dot org uh, will also tell you uh, more about the, uh, the, the 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 crime that the Egyptian government has perpetrated on a uh, person trying to express their opinion. Um, but uh, so that's sad. Um, but, uh, and this but, is happy, uh, at least on my end of things. We are in the beginning of the first hundred days for the new Democratic Congress. Nancy Pelosi and her hordes of, uh, as Will would note, I put it, jackbooted minions have begun trying to <laughs> pass the. Legislation, the 6406 that Democrats ran on in the midterm elections, and that possibly was a, a large part of their uh, of their genuinely successful showing, which is an odd thing to say given that they've not had too many of those in recent years. Um, today, if I if memory doesn't fail, they're doing either the 911 Commission or the ethics bills. But over mm -hmm. the next couple of days, they will also do minimum wage, college affordability, uh, negotiations on Medicare, which I have a particular affection for. And I thought I would turn it over to Will to invade against the horrors of uh, creeping big government liberalism. Well, uh, but 
It's in they is something that it sounds like a crotchety horse does. <laughs> uh, but 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 I'll, but I'll do my best to uh, to invade. Well, the, I mean, the question that I have for you, uh, Ezra. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're more closely affiliated with a political party. You're no, I work a, for a 501c3. Well, I have no opinions on anything yeah, of this matter. Yeah, you, you I'm work purely for an educational C3. type as, of writer. As, as, so, as so do I. But 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 I, I'm willing to bet that uh, that that you generally vote for Democrats. Just I mean, that's just a guess. It's a guess. Well, you know. You, you uh, can believe uh, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, and, and, but as a journalist, you have a responsibility to be neutral, and, and, and I respect that. But, do, but, but as someone who may or may not be a Democrat, do you find anything appealing? Anything appealing? Yeah, in the, in the particular package of, uh, of proposals. Is this what you wanted uh, when you did or didn't vote for in Democratic the, candidates? In the, in the soft form of many of the things that I wanted, mm-hmm. but... Indeed, I think that some of the proposals being floated right now will have an enormous positive impact. You and I before have argued on the minimum wage, which Mm -hmm. you believe has um, very serious employment dislocation effects, and I believe has very, very modest ones, and the good outweighs the harm. I believe um, the imposition of most of the 9-11 rules will be good. The ethics reforms will be hopefully good, although I tend to think that you're not going to get anything there without genuine public financing. The one that I tend to be, called affordability, I have a little bit more problem with, given that the federal budget is a zero-sum game, given that... What, what is it? Calls what affordability. affordability. Mm-hmm. I, I assume it's deductibility of tuition and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, increasing Pell. That's all good. I mean, in a perfect world, I would like college to be free, and we give it out with candy bars. But, in fact, I tend to worry a little bit more about putting heavy resources into the people who will, you know, be, be affluent and, generally speaking, will do okay once they get out of there. I, I don't know that it is, in fact, the most pressing line item to address in the budget and to, I don't to, think to jack really up federal funding for yeah, higher know, education it's good right no, well, I, again, I, mean, I don't want, I'm not against college I think people should go I, I don't think people should graduate with mountains of debt even though yeah. that ends up happening I just given given the different things that we do need to it seems mm-hmm. to be subsidized this would not be where I'd put my, my first dollar mm-hmm. well I mean it's you know Already subsidized up the Yang, uh, without, right. you know, prior to sure. uh, giving people uh, Pell grants and uh, and uh, and uh, you know cheap money. Right. I don't uh, want to subsidize private colleges. I mean, th- there are things in there that it seems to me we are uh, Democrats are seeking too hard to hit the. You know, it's a big middle class. Well, it's clearly a stop very, for very sort of middle class voters. Right. right? Exactly. I mean, and and the thing is, it's one of those it's one of those areas. Where, um, you know, uh, the, the cost of tuition, uh, you know, climbs just as fast as the government can, can increase the, uh, you know, the, the, the size of loans and the size of Pell Grants. Well, I mean, that, it, it, that I'm less convinced by the research on that than, than you are. What Will is referring to is that there are a number of papers out there by authors that try to prove that when the government increases Pell Grants, when the government increases loans, what happens is in lockstep. Um, prices go up. That isn't entirely true. There's a lot of evidence, particularly in private colleges, that they're just leaving money on the table. Take UCLA, take um, my... Well, yeah, I, I come from, by the way, um, I grew up on the academic housing at UCI, University of California, Irvine. My mm-hmm. father is a, is a mathematician there. And places like that, UCLA Law School, the professional schools particularly, are leaving tons, tons of money on the table. I mean, they could be charging exactly what or, or very, very close to what the top tier privates are and they don't. And there are people in there who would like them to individuate more from the government to get more of the public teeth so they can actually bring in more money, so they can bring in more funding, so they can do more. But um, Now, why, why, why do you think they do that? I mean, it's an interesting question. I, I read an mm-hmm. article recently, I can't remember where it was, where, where some colleges were raising their tuition just as a signaling, a signaling device. Yeah. Like, that that, if, that uh, if it costs $40,000, then, you know, then it must be good. Um, but there are, a lot, especially a lot of state universities, uh, uh, especially the, uh, the state universities that are exclusive, they're hard to get into, uh, where people would be very willing to pay um, a much larger tuition to get in. Um, but you know, part of the mission, I guess, of a state university is to provide uh, uh, a, a not-so-expensive public education. But, but so in a, in a way, those people are being subset, you know, that all the students at Berkeley or uh, Michigan or Virginia or some other sort of, like, very prestigious public institution mm-hmm. are being... Uh, you know, very, very, you know, very healthily subsidized by the taxpayers right. of that state. Now, why don't they just um, price discriminate uh, more directly? Say, here's what it costs to go here. Here's what the market demand is. Uh, it, it costs 
So if you want to go to the University of Virginia, it's sixty thousand dollars, and then we start cutting the price based on Income. all of these things that we want. Yeah, like like if you if you, if you don't have as much money, if uh, you're one of the sort of favored demographic groups that we think adds balance to our freshman mm -hmm. class, and so on and so forth. Well, to um, some it, degree, they do. I mean, of course, yeah. you're not really allowed to do that on race, but. In fact, what Pell Grants do, what um, loans do, what grants do, what scholarships do, is exactly that. So the sticker price at a place like you know, UCLA or wherever, say $15,000 a year in tuition, mm -hmm. that yeah, is not what the median, I mean, even what the median student pays. They have a ton of loans, they have a ton in, um, you know, in, in grants and all the rest of it. So mm -hmm. in, in a... In, in a somewhat subtle way, but not very. I mean, you know, it's not a secret that you get that you get affordability help. They do do that, I think. Now, why yeah, don't we make it more explicit and why don't we make uh, it much higher? I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, other things in the first hundred days, though, like, yeah, I mean, see, most of it, most of it, of course, just leaves uh, leaves me cold. Most of it just seems right. cravenly uh, political. Uh, the you know things like the minimum wage it's it's very very popular. Well, I guarantee uh, you that on the part of progressives and Democrats, you may disagree with their reasoning. It is not for them cravenly political. Few things excite them as much. Do, few things do they feel are as moral issues as the minimum wage. So that that very much is not merely a sop to win votes. I mean, there are because, things because that you can argue that way. I'm sorry. The minimum wage is a moral issue is because you want to make sure that. Uh, the urban poor have a hard time getting jobs and human capital that brings but them out of poverty. But you, I mean, again, people <laughs> always say that. Well, and, I mean, the, <laughs> they, they always the, say you, that because it's... But it is I mean, and up. Many, many, you know, and, and Tyler Cohen, I mean, others have, have written about this, that you do see some amount of, um, or, or can at times, see some amount of employment dislocation. You do not see very much at all. And, and it's very much an open question whether you well, will, uh, I think, I, whether you have I, more or less in the amount I of... I think this is generally attributed... Yeah, they... they, they, they the, 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 the first thing, I mean, like, like uh, I, you know, I've, I've blogged about this several times. I mean, there's, there's no escaping. I mean, the law of demand is not an iron law. There are exceptions, but exceptions are very rare uh, and very far between. And when you... Uh, but you assume in the law of demand that we're at equilibrium. I mean, when, when you make this argument, well, what you do is you, is you say it is you essentially say or imply that we are at a place where the bottom of labor is either at or higher than what people are willing to pay. And someone like me will reply to you that no, in fact, the minimum wage is in real terms at its lowest level in 55 or 56 or 54 years. And that in fact, um, workers have much less bargaining power in, in this culture than they should. There is not any, it is not a, a fair, it is not a fair economy for them at well, all. What's, so what, what's, the evidence, uh, what's the evidence that we don't have a competitive well, labor market? A, a good I evidence mean, for, would be the fact that when we did, when last time we raised the minimum wage in 94, or was it 96, I think maybe, 98? Anyway, what, what, the other time we did it, you did not see employment dislocation. You just didn't. Employment went up. Now, you could argue that it would have gone up, it went up, you know, whatever, 3.3%. Well, those, are, those, those up, are a few contestable studies. But, that, but the point that I wanted to make mm -hmm. is that, and, and this is something that, 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 that I, I often find aggravating in, these, uh, in discussing issues like the minimum wage, uh, especially when you're talking uh, to people who are, 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 are strongly in favor of government interventions in the market, is there's usually some sort of general broad acceptance of the, uh, of the incredibly empirically well-established uh, sort of principles of uh, the laws of economics, such mm -hmm. as the law of demand, that other things being equal, if you raise the price of something, uh, people will buy less. Right. Uh, now, 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 in, in like uh, a lesson that I learned a long time ago is, of course, there's all sorts of different dimensions that an mm -hmm. employer can adjust. They might not just buy less labor. They might turn down the air conditioning a little bit. They mm -hmm. might. Uh, they might actually. They might have been lax before about how long their employees had for you know, their break times, and all of a sudden they crack down so that they get more actual work out of them, out of the work hours. They might, they might uh, start uh, uh, hiring more, uh, just more productive workers and giving the, the less productive workers less of a chance, mm -hmm. but you might not see that as, a, as an overall effect in the market. And, and so, it, it, you know, they, they can, of course, uh, raise prices. There, so there's all these different dimensions that, that a buyer of labor can do uh, to adjust for an increase in the uh, you know, government-mandated increase in the price of labor. Uh, so you, so the, just saying that you don't necessarily see a disemployment effect, uh, it, it doesn't say anything because it, it doesn't say much because other things being equal, you just know that increasing the price on this good is going to 
have some. It's but going as you to, know it's well, a, I mean, a, the effect is going to come up under the rug somewhere else. The effect isn't simply. I mean, by the way, I think a lot of liberals would argue that okay, if they have to turn on the the air conditioning and save a bit of carbon, so be it. But put that aside. Uh, assume you're right, even though I think you would have to say where you're right and whether that is an inefficiency that shouldn't be cut. But assume you're right. What you then have to argue, and what liberals argue to you, and I don't really think you have a, a, a terribly persuasive response back to, is that whatever that dislocation is, whatever that cost-cutting measure is, wherever the employers make up that money, that that is a less desirable place for that money to be made up than it is, than it is positively desirable to have um, a bit more money in the in the pockets of low-income service employees, generally speaking. Well, and see, that, that is where we really end up, end up in the argument. And I think the fundamental thing somebody like me would argue to you is that the service employees are people who actually end up making the minimum wage, and it is not contrary to belief. A bunch of all, all teenagers, or a lot of teenagers, it is not, but, but they are not in any way a majority, not even near it. Um, what, what somebody like me would argue to you is that these people cannot bargain. They cannot get their wages up. Many of them, as Heather Boucher at CPR ha has shown pretty conclusively, get locked into these wages for, for many, many years. And for a variety of reasons, I'm not saying it, it is all, it, it's not just malicious employers. People are socialized poorly. They have criminal records. I mean, and bad things happen, and it hurts them in the workforce. But well, so what I, I you mean, do are you have, saying that if they, people have done things that diminish their bargaining power, then they have less bargaining power? No, I'm power. also that's saying that we have, true. structurally, we have fewer unions. You have less bargaining power in this economy, I mean, just and over that, time. And that, that, the, uh, the, we've got you know, just a massively competitive, open uh, labor market relative to the rest of the world. It's one of the reasons we have uh, very healthy, low uh, rates of unemployment. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, and, and people tend not but to think But you've not of, seen, I mean, and one very notable fact about the economy over the past decade or so is that until very, very recently, and it's been very weak even recently, as the employment went down, you did not see wages rising quickly. You just did it. They, it. It was surprising to many. I mean, first you have what was called jobless recovery. But in this recovery, you've seen the only period in American history when um, the economy grew for a consecutive years, four or five, and in each of those years, poverty grew. That had never happened before. Well, the, well, growth, well, the, the growth is very much at the top, and uh, you're right that unemployment has gone down, and unemployment is a very, very healthy low. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about th that, that uh, particular issue when we talk about uh, inequality sure. in, in, a, in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and again, but with this issue uh, about uh, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, low unemployment but, uh, not, uh, but uh, wages not increasing for people at the bottom, a again, I'm, like, I'm, very, I'm very skeptical of the way uh, the uh, people, you know, the wages haven't grown in so long. Uh, I think the way that they, you know, uh, determine what the real wages is, the way the methodology for the CPI deflator and so on and so forth are, are, are very questionable, and it's hard to know exactly what it is people, you know. So, so if, if, so if places of business are nicer than they used to be, if jobs are less arduous than they used to be uh, as far as physical labor, if they're safer than they used to be, in general, if you have air conditioning and you didn't used to have air conditioning, uh, if you uh, if you uh, if the food that you get at your fast food restaurant for free during break is better, uh, these are all dimensions of compensation that go measure uh, that go unmeasured. Well, you have to and, you have to and, prove and, them though, and, and that I haven't seen done. I mean, look, I'm not going to argue, and we can get into this a mm -hmm. little bit later when we talk about mm -hmm. libertarians. But I'm not going to argue that things because of technological increases or. Um, you know, or, or whatever, changes in the climate, whatever it may be, mm. haven't gotten better for people over long periods of time. I mean, I mm. would, you know, prefer to be alive in 2005 or 8 or 10, I mm. assume, than I would in 1912 or 1915. But I don't think, it, it, I mean, it is not a shut case right there that what you're seeing is really awesome compensation because the, the burgers people are getting on their breaks are of slightly better quality if they are. I mean... That has to be proven, and you need mm -hmm. to you need to make that case. Between 2000 and 05, the median worker sees a 5% drop in wages. That goes as well for um, college-educated workers, which was right. uh, really a surprise to a lot and of I'm people. And I'm contesting that they necessarily do see that drop in wages because of the way that you measure uh, the wages. So, so the so, so, that, but I, I feel like that. I, I know. I, we're, we're, so, so we both have <laughs> something that we want the other guy to prove. Mm -hmm. One is uh, I I want you to show. That there is some, there's, there's any sense in which the uh, American labor market 
is less competitive than it has been in the past so that workers uh, at the bottom of the income distribution have less bargaining power than they used to. And that well, is you can a, say certainly that, that, that there's less unionization, which would give them less bargaining risen. power. Right. So, so that's your theory. Not the uh, only I, theory, I, but that would – I mean, there are certainly a number of things that would give them um, less bargaining power. But I'll, I'll say this, and I, and I find this one will be – you know, you, what, I, what it seems to me you have to do is – so we have, you know – eras in American history, we can say here was what the wage growth was, and here's what the unemployment was, and here were the, the sort of relationships there, and it was very, very high in the post-war period. It was very, very high up until about 79, and then drops precipitously. You have stagflation. You have all that. But okay, say in the 90s, you have quite low unemployment, but not so much lower than we have now. But during mm -hmm. all that period, you had very, very, you had very, for that decade at least, very high wage growth. Um, you don't now. So what what great things are happening to workers? What great things are happening to um, unrecorded compensation that were not happening between 95 and 99? And that I, I, I just don't see an answer to. I, I just don't. And, and maybe you can enlighten me. I mean, is the air conditioning gotten much better or the, the, the free food or the way the carpet feels underneath your feet? I, what is it? Where is that money Yeah, well, that's from? the thing. I th I, I, and, and this is one of the difficult problems of measuring mm -hmm. these things all, all, all together. I think most workplaces, even for service employees, have gotten a lot, lot nicer. Uh, so suppose you're a maid in a hotel uh, who's, uh, who's changing beds. It can be a, a, a very, very difficult job. Um, but the entire milieu, the, 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 the place of work, is so much nicer. Uh, the, just but it's the, actually, the, the, here's an interesting case, right, being a hotel mm -hmm. maid. Mm -hmm. um, that has gotten to be a much worse job. You know when you go to a hotel now and they say a Sealy, Comfort, Super mm -hmm. Sleep, Sleep Forever, Rip Van Winkle mattress. The mattresses are heavier than they They're used to be. They're much heavier. They're mm -hmm. 100 pounds, and they have less labor per room or whatever. And um, the number of on-site injuries is huge, is huge. Meanwhile, you have much less health care down at that level than you used to. You know, you have seen people being dropped from employer roles, not at a not at a hyper-accelerated rate, but an accelerated yep. rate. You have rate. less health care than you used to? Yes, and uh, you, have, you have less people on employer-based health care than you used to, than you did 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, a higher, and, and, a higher and number of people, people go on the individual market and a lower number mm -hmm. of, um, of uh, low-income jobs offered. And, and that is mm -hmm. a sort of necessary and, and very obvious effect. What happens yeah. is you had older companies like Sears and Kmart who gave better benefits and Target for that matter. And one of the ways Walmart got a competitive advantage of the, on them, and I think this was a perfectly fair move by Walmart, so to speak, was to offer less health care, to start moving people to part-time very, very savvily. I mean, now you're trying to see people follow that. Back in California about five years ago, you had a, a huge strike, huge, of all the major supermarket chains, mm -hmm. Ralph's and Albertsons and everybody. And what was going on was that the, the Safeway, was it the Safeway Corporation? I think, but possibly not. Um, was renegotiating their health care, trying to, and the union wasn't having it. And what the Safeway, what the corporation was arguing was that we, Walmart is now moving into the supermarket business and we cannot compete with their labor costs. Okay. And they won that strike. They, I, I, not the, the corporations did, not, not the workers. Now, I don't tend to blame Walmart for that. I think corporations are fundamentally dumb beasts who go towards profit. That's what we've built them for. That's what they should do. And they should not be charged with giving people health care. It just shouldn't be their job. But, um, you know, you do, have, you do have fewer benefits, and um, not that what benefits there are aren't costing more. Health inflation has been staggering, and we can talk about that later if we want. But you, you have fewer benefits, and particularly in the, the sort of lower income, um, mm -hmm. the, the lower income quintiles, simply because uh, Walmart, which is now one out of every five retail purchases in the country, go through their register, has put enormous pressure all across the industry. To, um, to throw people off the rolls, to degrade the benefits, to, you know, move towards cutting labor costs. And you see that Goldman Sachs in a recent, um, you know, report on why X, Y, and Z sectors were doing well said that historically labor costs are, are at a real low in this country, and this is even as corporate profits are at an unbelievable high, and the economy appears in a macroeconomic sense pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. That is coming from somewhere, and it's coming, you know, out of these people's pockets. So it's hard for me to say that they should have. Well, there's lots have. of places. That, I mean, see, and, and, and as we begin to, there's, uh, you, you threw out a lot of facts there that are that are very difficult to disentangle. So I sure. obviously can't uh, 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 address all of them. Um, but when, but when, say, uh, Walmart uh, becomes, uh, uh, you know, has more part-time workers, or they, uh, or they. Uh, uh, or they uh, trim benefits in, in ways that uh, allow them to have higher margins. Uh, you know, there's 
lots of ramifying effects of that, one of which is that, uh, that uh, poorer people uh, especially benefit mm-hmm. from lower, co- lower prices Indeed. for consumer goods all across the board. And so, again, it's like when you're trying to figure out what the, what the overall difference in real wages is, you ha- if, if, uh, the, if the money wage that they were getting from their employer has stayed more or less the same, uh, but, the, uh, but the prices have dropped, then the real wages should have gone up. But, again, the way you calculate these things is very difficult. Like the CBI right. for a long time had a bias against big box stores. And so we're, you yeah, know, by we're, the way, we're, I'll we're, say on that, on like, the it's, it's, hard to grasp, it's, it's hard to grasp exactly what the offsetting benefit is right. from Walmart the Walmart efficiency Walmart. into Walmart. their figures, by the way. Yeah. And this is a fascinating thing mm-hmm. and not, not a criticism of them. But, mm-hmm. you know, there was a uh, – this was pointed out by – um, the book, The Walmart Effect, and I'm forgetting the author's name, but so there was an article in the Philadelphia, I think, Inquirer or something mm-hmm. about Little Debbie snack cakes, which are, mm-hmm. are made in the area or in Pittsburgh or something, mm-hmm. and they were talking about how the snack cake industry is um, stagnated at $850 million a year, but it turned out that Walmart won't let anybody look into how many snack cakes they're selling, and so all of this data can't take into account the biggest retailer in America, so the industry could now be at you know 1.2 billion, 1.5 billion, whatever it may be, but mm-hmm. um, they won't let anybody know. So you're right, by the way. That is, um, it is hard to disentangle. Although I would suggest that the very unwillingness of Walmart, and this is not in any way a proven case, but their very unwillingness to let anybody know anything about the data, and they keep voluminous data over everything well, I, they I, do. I wasn't making a point about Walmart specifically. No, no, no. I was I, just I know, saying that, what I'm saying so, is that so you're right, it is hard you know, to measure. But here, here's an area where mm-hmm. there, are, there, are, there are increasing efficiencies in the market mm-hmm. uh, that, that the, our, our methodology for measuring wages tends to lag behind uh, the innovations in the way uh, uh, pri- uh, goods are delivered, what it is that's valuable about goods. At the same time, other reasons why... Uh, why, uh, why wages can be stagnant is because of a larger supply of labor. So that's why a lot of anti-immigration folks want to mm-hmm. uh, do a better job of shutting out uh, Mexican uh, uh, workers, uh, whether legal or illegal, because they flood uh, the low-end labor mm-hmm. market in some places. And then again, there's, uh, there's te- technical advances where people are displaced by a machine that can do what they were doing before. Uh, all of these things go into, uh, you know, all of these effects are uh, taking place simultaneously, and they can have the effect of making uh, wages flatten out in some sure. ways, but well, also sure. making the standard of living uh, better in others. Um, and so, that, but, but my, my difficulty tends to be that, that, the, that the policy proposals uh, that, uh, that, that are generally espoused by so-called progressives tend to... Uh, Target single causes of those things, like like mm-hmm. corporations or the sort of oligarchy well, is having some sort of conspiratorial plan of of taking a bigger chunk of the pie from the uh, I don't know man. about that at all. And Will, that um, really is sort of paranoid. There are all simple, these dynamic um, remedy uh, right here. We're saying wages are too the, low. The, the sort of and evidence, we should raise them. Uh, I just heard a weird noise on your end. Are you still there, by the way? The, did you hear a weird noise? Uh, okay, yeah. I just want to make sure you were what? still on the line. Uh, we can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Now you're fine. We have a very simple remedy. I mean, we're not mm-hmm. saying it's monocausal. We're just saying it's poss- there's possibly a, not a simple solution, but one that could have a great effect. You raise the wage. Now, let's say we raise the wage, right? Let's say mm-hmm. the minimum wage affecting, you know, whatever it is, 7 million people, goes up by a buck 25 over the next couple of years mm-hmm. or $2 even. Oh, my God. And suddenly we see widespread layoffs. I mean, every store in the country turns off the air conditioning, and um, nobody gets free food on breaks anymore, and nobody's got a job. That can be undone, but I think where I would end up, and possibly you wouldn't, is that I will end up um, erring on the side of raising the wages of low-income workers, and I, I will do that happily. And mm-hmm. I don't think, and again, I don't exclu- think any excluding, of the research, by the way, suggests we'll see such a bad effect that will yeah. have a problem. Yeah, uh, and, and again, my, my position tends to be more, uh, I mean, one, I think it's just uh, it, the, either the effect is, uh, is almost nothing, or negative, mm-hmm. and then secondarily, just in principle, this is an issue where uh, you're uh, you, you're interfering with the ability of individuals to enter into voluntary agreements with people that they both agree are to their advantage. And that's, I would argue and, that and the um, people that, that that kind of restriction hurts the most are always the poorest because the people I don't with the think, least I don't skills, think that's true. The least ability a, to I don't speak the language. I also don't think the history of the the creation of the middle class. Um, 
shows that in this country. I mean, you would say that about unions, you would say it about the, min the minimum wage, you would say it about the safety net, that everybody should be able to enter into their agreements, and, and so on and so forth. I would argue, a progressive would argue, so far as the economy goes, that in fact, corporations have a large and unmistakable advantage. It has to be remedied by their countervailing powers. All right, well, then this is it. This, uh, this, I mean, this, this, this can move us into the next thing because we're probably sure. boring the crap out of people uh, uh, talking about the, what, the minimum wage. What, you mean boring people yelling at each other about the minimum wage? I'm yeah, shocked. Yeah, I mean, because we'll we, we, we get into it. So, but, when, but when you look at, so when I look at the, uh, you know, the, the, the agenda behind the, you know, Pelosi's mm -hmm. first 100 days, um, I don't see uh, a, a coherent public philosophy that the Democrats stand for. What I see is a bunch of special interest groups, sure. uh, teachers unions, uh, you know, the, 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 the service unions, you know, all these different interest groups who, uh, you know, comprise the, the base of the Democratic Party uh, have things that they want because it benefits the members of their interest. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then I'm always amazed when all, of these, uh, when all of these interests are sort of aggregated and that's suddenly a vision of the common wheel. Um, when, it, when, when it seems almost obvious to me that it's just a, a hodgepodge of political favors to uh, groups who are responsible for electing the political representatives. Uh, so all it really seems to is, is, is again, just sort of a, a craven uh, you know, move on the part of politicians to keep their interests intact and to keep getting votes to get them into office. But I don't see how it is other than in just a, 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 a rhetorical sense where people talk about hope and opportunity for the working man and two Americas and all this sort of thing. I don't really see how there's even an intelligible uh, set of ideas uh, that either the Democrats or the Republicans have that give us a vision, give us a direction, give us a s set of standards uh, by which to evaluate uh, policy proposals and uh, by, by which to give us a, an idea of a, something that we ought to be aiming at. Are you saying the Democrats don't have ideas, Will? <laughs> okay, I'm not let, saying let that they don't to, have ideas. I'm saying they have great ideas about how to keep their constituencies intact. And well, I think their ideas for keeping their constituencies intact are, are quite poor. I wrote an article a couple months ago <laughs> called Strategic Two Firsts about yeah. different policies they could use to grow and expand and empower their coalition. And I don't think you see them pushing them. And it, it's a yeah. shame to me. But let me try and answer a bit of that. I, I would first say that I think that you have a lot of causal issues there, right? A couple months ago, you see an article come out in the New York Times, if I remember correctly, and it, it scratches its head and says, oh my God, if you look at the people defending Walmart right now, you see mm -hmm. people like Cato and the Heritage Institute, and they have, in fact, taken money from Walmart. And I wrote, and if I remember, you actually linked to me um, appreciatively yeah. writing, saying that, look, I know the people at Cato, they are, gener they are, are just genuinely demented um, oligarchic free marketeers. And Walmart is certainly funding them, or almost surely funding them, because they all agree uh, previously. Now, take me, right? I do not join, I do not belong to a union. I, am, mm -hmm. I don't make a lot of money, but I'm not particularly poor. But I very, very much support this agenda we're talking about. And mm -hmm. the idea that Democrats have. Um, believe that you should have a higher minimum wage, believe that you should have universal health care, believe that you should push down the prices on, on drugs, believe that you should, that workers should have more freedom or at least more ability to organize. The idea that this would be only a collection uh, of interest groups would be like me saying to you, Will, your agenda is clearly so simplistic and, and it takes into account so little of the, the ravages of, and, and vagaries of, uh, of American life and fate and luck, that it, it's clearly a way to just keep the winners winning and allow capitalism sort of rich get richer effects to increase and accelerate. But it, it, it isn't that way. If you look at what the Democrats have done, in fact, you know, it isn't quite as coherent as you like because what we're talking here is, an a, is actual legislation and not sort of what Ezra Klein or Wilkinson or Think Tank or a magazine or, or somebody who doesn't actually have to get elected or, or deal with the legislative process thinks should be done. But look, you have calls affordability. You have Medicare prescription drug bargaining. bargaining. Mm -hmm. You have... Um, the minimum wage. You have a couple other sort of sun Yeah, what's, the, what's the underlying principle? The underlying principle there would be that for probably the bottom 70% of this country, economic insecurity is, has become a real and growing problem, and we should try to make things easier on that. What, I, what's, I what, what's economic insecurity? I hear people talking about economic insecurity. I have no idea what it means. Tell me what that means. What's the idea there insecurity? would be that you are, that 
ordinary families are having mm -hmm. more trouble paying for the things that we would uh, associate with economic security. So pensions, you've moved, you've had a real move from defined benefit to 401k pensions mm -hmm. over the last couple of decades, which make um, retirement, you know, much more insecure and certainly much more, much less generous. You've had a real move towards yeah, but the, I mean, the, the, that, that, healthcare. I mean, that, see, that's exactly the thing. Mm -hmm. Ezra, like that, that, that statement that you just said just absolutely baffles me. Sure. Right. All the, all these divine, uh, all these defined benefit pension plans are going bust sure. because they're so poorly designed. In what sense is it defined? In no way are those two things mutually exclusive. How, how is that, how is that though, a right? more, more okay, secure so let's system? Say we're talking so you're the improving people's economic bust, security. Right? Let's, say, let's talk before they went bust, right? People think they're going to retire and they'll have mm -hmm. this, this defined benefit pension. They, they could have been wrong about this. It could have always been sure that this would go bust and this would be a terrible idea and this was all going to collapse in on itself like a house of cards. But the ordinary retiree did not know that. And so they have, in fact, suffered loss in security, even if that was an inevitable, um, inexorable effect of the, of the way the programs were designed. So do you think Health the standard certainly gotten harder for people to pay for. I mean, I don't think you would argue with that, nor would I. Here's, a, here's just a simple question. Mm -hmm. Is the standard of living, is today's retiree, do they have, are they wealthier or less wealthier than retirees 20, 30 years ago? Do they have more assets or fewer assets? I'm sure they have more assets, and as we would hope. Right, and so uh, in what sense are they less economically secure? But I wouldn't secure. say the retirees right now particularly are less economically secure. But, you know, I mean, we can go well, back. Uh, uh, that's what I'm saying. So they've got more money. But they're not. Uh, and, and, and they've got more money than mm -hmm. any uh, cohort in history. And in what sense is, uh, are today's American retirees, who really are about the richest group of people that have ever existed in the entire universe, in what sense are they more economically insecure? But I don't think, uh, I mean, again, it's we, you, you for some reason zoomed in on retirees when a moment ago we were talking about low-income workers. I assume what you're actually talking about here is Medicare. Am I wrong? No, no, I'm just talking about overall. I, this, this idea of economic security uh, is profoundly... Because uh, we're not, uh, I mean, even when I talk because about, the, the when standard I talk about of retirement right here, right, we said, we mm -hmm. talked a moment ago about today's, uh, about the retirees of today, how, in fact, they had, a lot of them, defined benefit pensions, how they had easy health care, how they've moved into a time when Medicare is, in fact, quite lavish. Um, that is why they're so well off. But, well, in I fact, we need what to we're talking what, about I, I think tomorrow. that we need to... We need to define what the issue is. Like, so it, when, you're t when we're talking about economic security, are we talking about uh, material quality of life? But what, or what are I was talk talking about, are we I mean, talking, I feel, I, I feel are we well talking that you, you just sort of left the issue behind anxiety. a moment ago. So let, let's hmm? backtrack for a minute here, okay? okay. I okay. say a moment ago that what is happening here in, in mm -hmm. the view of a lot of people is that as opposed to 20 or 30 years ago, people's retirements look somewhat more risky and, and somewhat less secure. They do not have defined benefit pensions and so forth. And you say that today's retirees... So you're saying they look more risky, but because obviously we know that the, it was, in fact, more risky because you're running the risk that your company doesn't well, run the profits. Well, that didn't happen to this generation of retirees, well. As you say, they're doing wonderfully. Just no, it, it, has, it, it has happened to a lot of this generation. Not many, not that many. I mean, even if you do look at those numbers, even if you do look at the pensions that went bust, it, it was not that many. What you had much more was a flee. I mean, companies fled from having to do this. GM is still putting those as defined benefit pensions, man. And if you have, if you I know, were and it's, looked it, on, and it's ruining them, them all it the is ruining that... GM, but it doesn't make today's retirees... Um, it doesn't put them in a risky situation. They're doing great. Now, you could argue they shouldn't be. You could argue that was a bad move by GM. You but should argue that it would be morally, ethically, economically unwise for that to be um, perpetuated I, I, I on to the next generation. I just want to ask you a series of, of, of very easy yes or no questions. Okay, so do you think that... And I, uh, I don't want to play Socratic games. A group uh, do you, between, you say, 40 and 60 right now. Security? Because you seem to be focusing uh, do you think none of the people they, who their the policies to address economic assets, security are economic addressing. I think standard we would all think it's agree going to be lower than the, the real current set of One of the great triumphs of liberalism yes, in right recent now. years was making retirees, making this generation particularly of retirees, secure. They have Medicare. They have Social Security. Unions won them great benefits, which you could argue were economically unwise or, or wise, but either way. Mm -hmm. But nobody will is arguing that, they, that this generation of retirees is in, is in economically bad shape. No, that's what I'm saying. I'm talking about the next generation of retirees. Okay. Do you think when they retire, they're when, in How are we defining the, next the, generation first? I, I just said, like, the people who are right now between 40 years old and 60 years old, say, mm -hmm. and, and, and within the next... Uh, 25 years when that whole group is is in retirement, 
is that group going to be worse off than the group that is now from like 65 to 80 something? Well, how are they going to be? Are, are they going to be worse? Do you think? Do you think that they're going to be worse off? I don't know. I, I don't know what will happen with Medicare's budget. I mean, <laughs> things can move very, very quickly if, if in fact, say the Will Wilkinson and Brink Lindsay and Arnold Kling ideas about Medicare are adopted. Mm -hmm. We're going to have they're going to have much more problem, and they're going to be in a much riskier situation than today's are. You would agree with that, by the way. I, I think the entire idea behind what Arnold Kling wants to do to, wants to do to healthcare and to Medicare is to put more risk into it in order to sensitize people to price and make them, you know, and, and the idea is that they will bargain better and prices no, will go down. No, you don't put more risk in it. You, you do. You, 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 you See, I mean, so we're having a fundamental, uh, a different idea of what insecurity and risk and things like that mean. I guess because so. Because for me, economic insecurity, to be economically secure means that you have enough to meet your basic needs according to whatever the sort of prevailing standards of the society are. Uh, and, and, and economic security is, uh, is improving on almost every dimension. Now, uh, Jacob Hacker talks about things like income volatility, mm -hmm. um, but he's not actually talking about economic security in the sense of people having right, enough. Right, and I'm not mentioning income technology. volatility because I think there are... I'm not sure there's no issue there, but I think there are yeah. methodological questions. But let's talk about health care. Yeah, yeah I think, well, everybody I think this knows is a his good, numbers are going to crumble in the near future. Uh, I think this uh, is a good um, – I think healthcare is a, a good one to look at here. Okay, take the Arnold mm -hmm. Kling, and maybe we can get some definitional um, accuracy. Take, take the Arnold Kling idea. He wants to have, if I remember correctly, and I'm pretty sure I do, a $30,000 deductible. Now, you may say that's a really good idea. That'll do a really good job of getting people to to take seriously their health and how they how they, how much care they get, how they pay for care, um, what they choose to do when they choose to go to the doctor. You may think that'll be really good for the system, but under any definition I can think of, the idea that you get cancer and lose thirty thousand um, dollars in the near term versus the idea that you get cancer and have to pay a twenty dollar copay every time you go to the doctor, the former is going to make people feel, and I think will but tangibly it, it, make them it, it, be are people, more risky. Are people more or less likely to die of cancer in 20 years than they are now? I'm sorry, say that again? Are people more or less likely to die of cancer than... Will people be less likely to die of cancer in 20 years than they are today? Assumedly, yeah, but you never know. Right. And so, and so the, the, they're if more indeed likely to be secure in their health. If indeed the non-stick cookware I use is as bad as I say it is, yeah. we're screwed, Will. And the cell phones, yeah, man, it, it, Bluetooth... It, it, <laughs> we're, I think we, 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 we've been talking about this a long time, and we're going to have to move on yeah, uh, to probably. our last segment. Uh, but, but the, the oh, uh, that's a shame, because I want to talk the, about why you libertarians all love, love philosophy. Okay. So we, let's we, do this for maybe, a moment. Maybe, 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 we can, maybe we can just end on that, and then we can say uh, a little something about uh, Denmark. Tell us why we love philosophy. I, I genuinely don't know. But this issue comes from when the libertarian uh, debate happened from, Brink Lindsay, or from Will's boss, Frank Lindsay, a couple weeks ago. And I noticed something funny when I was trolling around for the, the blog post on that, on whether or not liberals and libertarians should get together. Liberals like me and like Kevin Drum looked at Brink's suggestions, and we looked at where he actually talked about policies, and we said, um, Brink appears to be suggest should sit there, suggesting that what liberals need to do is give up on Medicare, give up on Social Security, uh, give up on every bit of the entitlement state, give up on all things that are important to us, in fact, and go towards a libertarian conception of economics. What a lot of libertarians did, and you were very foremost here, was say Rawls would have really thought this was a great idea, and Hayek probably would have too. And I remember right after it happened that the first thing you did, Will, was you linked to an old essay you wrote about why Rawls would think Social Security privatization was a good idea. I didn't say why Rawls would think. I said or why, why, why... I'm sorry, why it accords why, better with Rawls' yeah, why, of and, and, well, and this gets to the core of this question about whether there's a coherent uh, a philosophy behind uh, the, the current sort of democratic agenda. Mm -hmm. um, the... the uh, I think of myself more than anything, more than a, as a libertarian, I think of myself as a liberal. I think of myself as, an, uh, as a classical liberal. Sure. And what I care about is having a society in which, uh, in which the conditions for prosperity and flourishing life are, 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 are uh, you know, enforced, are in place, and everybody has the opportunity to make the most of themselves. Everybody has the opportunity to become wealthy, to develop their capacities, mm -hmm. uh, to express their autonomy. These are just sort of the fundamental liberal ideals that free and equal people ought to be able to realize their ends and have a fair shot at it. Now, the question, when somebody like Brink says, well, you know what we need to do, we need to reform Social Security, uh, 
the reason that he's saying that is because the current system has gigantic structural problems and is massively inefficient and wastes a lot of money uh, in, that people could better use to pursue uh, their plans. If they, could, if they had personal accounts that were giving them an annuity uh, above what they would have gotten through Social Security, it's hard to see how they've been harmed in any material way. Um, and in well, the, uh, it, but in fact, the privatization plans would not have done right, that. This is what I'm saying. Right. One so, of the so, key so, things about them, and one of the main reasons liberals rebelled, was that they would not have given annuity plans that gave them exactly what Social Security the, the, did. The, the main reason that not, not liberals rebelled, but people who are deeply devoted to the interests of the Democratic people Party who in rebelled, American life are called the, liberals. It's well. because the AARP uh, is, is deathly... Uh, you know, just, but that's just, crazy. Do you really think, Will, I mean, when, when you sit at home and think about this, what, mm -hmm. is what you really say to yourself that the ARP called 22-year-old Ezra Klein and 24 no, or 25-year-old Matthew Iglesias of entered their office and said, Matt and Ezra, if you don't stop what you're doing, if you don't turn against Social Security privatization right this second... You're done in American well, here, life. Here's what I, here's what I, I think mean, happens, and I'm really interested in the psychology mm -hmm. of, of political commitment. I think what happens is, is, is most people say, okay, I've got to pick a team. You know, here's my team. I've picked a team. Okay, now here's what my team believes. Two. And then three, here's some ex post justification that rationalizes why the things that my team believes make sense. And you think you're immune and, to that and, as a libertarian? And, 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 and you are so committed to... to, uh, to the, the, your identity, your solidarity with the team, that it becomes very natural but to... But that's a very odd thing. Well, I mean, if you take what I believe, and mm -hmm. I, I will certainly, um, I, I would certainly assume that you'll find a lot of, a, a certain amount of inconsistency among people who need to be elected. But if you take what I believe, yeah. I tend to go entirely uh, on the same things. You, you don't find in my economic outlook on life mm -hmm. a lot of disconnects, do you? You, you find that I think that we should have um, four people... I would argue safer, but in fact, what I mean no, is um, I more secure. No, I mean, I think you, I think you don't understand the coordinating function of the price system. It's one of those things. Once you understand it, no, like, say, I, I, natural I guess I would, I would get it. You and go I would through say the that you don't understand how fundamentally insecure the free market is and the disadvantage that um, ordinary workers are at when compared to um, when compared to corporations. But I think that, the free market is very, here, it's a very here, fragile well, is, set of institutions. But that, this and, is all fine, but this is a different argument that we're, that we're about to get sidetracked on to, mm -hmm. and I don't want to. We could argue, indeed, about press signaling and all that. Right. But you could but, believe that I'm under a fundamental misconception about how um, the market works or how unbelievably totally awesome it is. Mm -hmm. But that is not the same as saying that what I'm under is a fundamental misconception that the ARP's wish list should be mine. I have a certain set of beliefs, and they could be wrong or they could be right. Mm -hmm. But they are, they are, in fact, mine, and they make internal coherent sense. And right. this is a very different rationale than you gave just a couple and minutes ago. And, but I, 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 want to not get, I, I want to not get sidetracked off of it, which was that, and what was fascinating to me, was that, in fact, the justifications for this particular alliance were almost entirely through Rawls and through Hayek. And whether or not you believe that liberals are, um, or, or contemporary liberals, are entirely bought off by interest groups, what is fascinating to me is that you could make, you know, you wouldn't need the philosophy. It, it, you know, theoretically, you would have a certain set of things that you believe should be done in this country, and I can make that argument to you, and you would agree or disagree and reject it or accept it, and, and that would be that. But what actually happened was different. Liberals focused in on the policy. We had certain things that we believe should be done, uh, things that we believe accord with the way the we think the world should work. And you guys focused in on, very, very quickly, philosophy, that you thought we had sort of common first principles, and if you could argue from those, we would get there. And I thought that bespoke a very fundamental difference in how we look at the world, that, you know, that for a lot of liberals, particularly in this moment, the 06 and 07 moment, mm -hmm. that we're going to come back to power and possibly be able, be able to pass the things that we want to get passed and that we think that will improve things and that right, you guys right, are right. still... I, mean, I understand what you're saying, Ezra, and see, and see what, what, what I think, what, what I was trying to say and what I think Brink was trying to say is that, yeah, we understand that the Democratic Party uh, and, and the people who are professional advocates for the Democratic Party are very strongly in favor of Social Security, they're very strongly in favor of Medicare, they're very strongly in mm -hmm. favor of the minimum wage, and the reason that they espouse to be in favor of these things is because they believe that they will uh, uh, and, 
enable and advance liberal ideals, like making people better off, right. making it so the, so the least well-off are better off, making it so everybody has a better chance to really realize their goals, uh, you know, hopes and dreams mm -hmm. and all that. Um, and what we're saying is that there needs to be a serious empirical debate about if you have those ends, here are the means. But that and, wasn't and what I saw coming out. I mean, this is, in fact, the very point I'm trying no, to make. Because, because I can see, like, when I do health care, right, and this is true for Arnold Kling, by the way. You mm -hmm. know, I'm not saying nobody on the right knows how to form up a graph. But mm -hmm. when I talked about the health care, I have very serious empirical ideas about it. And I believe that it works better in certain ways than others and that we should attempt to pursue those ends. What I saw coming from the other side, this was true in, in Brink's article. It was true, you know, when I saw um, folks talking about Rawls, was not a bunch of graphs and a bunch of data about how if we followed the libertarian Arnold Kling idea on health care, the median American would have better benefits. The, the, the question is, is like, 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 so, so the thing is, is like if you're going to, because, because uh, I mean, I don't know if, if it's as clear to you if you're on the inside, but it really does look, when you're standing on the outside of partisan politics, it really does look suspiciously like the policies that each party is trying to implement are just favorite projects of their I, special I have interests. To say, well, I mean, it's by, very, I, very hard to, not to see it that way. I really so want to impress they, this upon you. If you're standing outside Cato and you look at the funding, it really does seem blah, 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 blah. And what I, what I try to do and what I think a lot of honest pro, or what I think a lot of people try to do is impute good faith rather than bad. No, and I say mean, that people in Cato thing. believe crazy things this because is they exactly believe crazy the things. Reason, Ezra, this uh -huh. is exactly the reason that you need to t say something about abstract philosophical principles. You have to say, Why? what what is it that we're trying, what are we aiming at as a society? But, What's and our this I find very confusing, right? I mean, like what, if what, I what, say what? to you, Will, that you're I saying think, that, if I you're say saying to you, that, I believe that monopsony bargaining power, uh, I mean, you can disagree with this, but if I say to you that I think if we go to a French-style, multi-payer, but heavily public healthcare system that has a fair amount of monopsony bargaining power, that has formularies, and I say, I look at the Veterans Administration health system, and I think they do a better job than anyone else, and I think that will make healthcare more secure, and I think it will make it cheaper, I think outcomes will be better, I think there will be less health inequality. At what point here are we not having the empirical debate, or even the first principle debate, that you want, at what point here do you sit outside that and say, well, Ezra, Ezra because, because, thinks that bargaining will bring down health costs, and he must. I mean, where where do you, are you? Where do you then have to move back to first principles? Because very clearly, what I think should happen, and I don't think even you need. To, it is clearly you first talking, principle. So you, you, you want to say that you, that, that you guys want to talk about policy? Uh, you know, like we, we're trying to get something done. But the, but the question is what. What are you trying to get done with the policy? Uh, and so this is and, easy and, and enough, right? It, it has nothing to do with Rawls. I am trying. I could say this in a, in a sentence. I would like a cheaper system with, that has universal guaranteed coverage and delivers better care. I mean, right. it but, okay, but, that, but that's the thing. So you just one of those one of those desiderata, uh, the universal guaranteed coverage. Why is that something that is desirable? Right, that's one of the questions. Is that something that's going to achieve these other ends? Or is it inconsistent with these ends? Whether like like cheaper coverage or more broader availability. Sometimes a guarantee makes it less likely that people get what they need. Right, and, and that's, that's where you have an empirical argument, that you have not that, about first I, principles, but about that. I mean, no, but but that's the thing. The the, the empirical argument is is, is pointless if, because when you're t unless you have some idea of the ends, you can, you can argue about means all day, but if you're not agreed on what the end ought to be, then you're just simply talking about but it. But again, how do we not it. have, um, if I say I want guaranteed, if I say I want guaranteed access, these are to me, and this I think is where you get into the interesting disconnect, ends. These are ends. I think these would be good things for society, and I would like to get there, and I do not see them as means to really, I mean, anything else, yes, a healthier, more secure population that can better follow their bliss because they won't be trapped into job lock and they won't be bankrupted when somebody in the family gets cancer and, and they'll, yeah. they'll have the security, blah, 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 blah. But I don't think you even need to have that. You, you need that other step right there. And this is what I find fascinating. And then when what you turn around then and do is you say that this is about interest groups. I mean, that, that seems like a real cop -out. Like, you don't actually want to have that conversation. What I kept seeing was at Brink. And, and I'm, you I'm guys sorry, so you're cutting out a little bit. I'm on sorry, me. am I? Yeah. Um, can you hear me now? As uh, it's, I it's would jockey. say. Um, well, we should probably finish up anyway here. But yeah, we need we need to, we need to wrap it up. So uh, so so what so why 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 don't you uh, why why do you 
make your last point, and uh, and I'll make mine, and we'll try to keep it brief because we've already gone over an hour. Oh, have we really? My God, will the time just flies with you? Um, I, I mean, I think my point is well made. That to what what staggered me was that in, indeed you don't have the sort of conversation I would expect that we that liberals did in fact seem to want to say. But look, like there, we have this vision for healthcare, and we think it would be better for X, Y, and Z reasons. And Brink wants to make thirty thousand dollars deductibles, which, for reasons I articulated earlier, I think they would make people less secure and have that that they don't take luck seriously enough, and they punish behavior that we shouldn't be punishing, etc. And people on the right said, right, but if you read Rawls, and I thought that was like right, a no, no, very that, odd that, that, argument. That's exactly the kind of thing you say, the, I don't think that takes luck seriously enough. So we need to have a conversation about uh, what it means to take luck seriously and why we should. I mean, it's, uh, it, uh, there's, no, there's no avoiding that, 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 that anybody who has, uh, that, that if you're doing anything with policy at all, you're trying to achieve some goal. And if you think that the goal is one that's worth having, then you have to have some rationale. You have to have some justification for why that's the end that we ought to be aiming at. Now, if we can agree on that, then there's a question of what the means to that end are. And it seems like, it seems when I'm talking to you about this, it seems like you want to just evade having the conversation at all. Because what I want to say, and what with the, sort of the point of the libertarian kind of thing is, is that I want to say I honestly care about liberal values. I want to make sure that people have enough that everybody can realize their potential, that people have longer lives, that they're not sick, so on and so forth. And one of the things that I want to be able to say, what, what I want other people to listen to, is I think that there's this huge body of knowledge about how it is that people coordinate their behavior in order for people to flourish in a, in a society. And price signals and markets are some of those things. And I feel like there's just some resistance to even having this argument about see, how I, it I is that, that markets can actually help realize a fundamental liberal end. But and I think, and I think part we'll of get to part the, the good part, the good part for, um, to, to point out exactly where the disagreement is. I think that you put it exactly right there, except that what you don't see is that there's an imputation of good faith here that mm -hmm. I say to you, I believe will, that you do mm -hmm. want a just society, that you want people to be better off. I assume you are not a bad person. Right. And then I assume, secondarily, that you have thought through this stuff enough that when you come to your conclusions about how society and healthcare, et cetera, should be structured, you know what you're saying. And mm -hmm. from there, what, I, want to, what I, I do is I look at that and I say, does that fulfill what I think would accord with my goals, my first principles? And it doesn't. And, and I, I've certainly given Arnold Kling a fair hearing, et cetera. And, and vice versa, I assume that you've given me the same um, consideration. Mm -hmm. And there's a weird well, no, thing that you, you appear to believe I that liberals, in fact, haven't, haven't figured out or haven't thought that the health system they want to create would create a, a, a society that they approve of. And, and I find that to be a very, very weird way to approach politics. I mean, certainly if you do it that way, it'll look to you like everything is a coalition of interest groups and so forth. But it, it, it's very strange, and I find it also very strange if you – if you find the arguments on the other side so convincing, given they've convinced, you know, 50% plus one or so of the population, while yours have convinced two, that, that they couldn't possibly have arrived here by good faith, that it had to have been the pernicious influence of AARP. I don't think it's the pernicious influence of AARP. What it is, at any, at any time, uh, there are people with a minority view. Uh, mm -hmm. And, 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 and all, all we're asking for is the opportunity to really to, to, re, to open up a conversation and, and, and say why it is that we think that certain ends, certain policies that we like, policies, mm -hmm. things that are going to do something, are going to realize ends that you care about. Now, you, I just heard you and told me. to be sure, me, we have I've one already, here. You just, you just told me. I've already thought about it, and I'm done. That's what I no, heard. No, I, I heard that I, I, like I, I told I, I you that I've already what thought Arnold about Clint it. said, and now I know what my answer is. But you have your answer, and, and, too, and, Will, and Brink kept it. Brink didn't change his answer. He said that we need to devolve the healthcare system essentially along the lines of every Cato paper. I've read you know the Cato papers and I wrote back and I said, no, 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 no. What we need to do is do the healthcare system the way liberals have thought that it should be done. And I, I mean, it's a very weird thing that you want to pull back as if nobody's ever had this argument before and nobody really thought about their ideas on the healthcare. I mean, I, I just find the whole thing no, that's very the thing. Nobody We really should have a conversation, but as you saw, nobody really actually right has here, had there's not this a whole argument lot of agreement. Before.
Nobody actually has had this argument before, and I think there really is a deep political incentive to not have certain kinds of arguments. Yeah, I find that, that odd. That, that if you're involved in a particular political coalition, and, and there is, and, 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 and you're always worried about how are we going to do in the next cycle, you can't afford to enter into I, I arguments. I have to tell you, well, I, I and, think they're and, giving and, too little credit to the fact that it may not be that people don't want to have the argument, and to, and too much credit to the fact that the people don't want to have the argument and too little to the fact that they may not find your answers convincing because they're well, not that, hidden. That's the thing. I, I, the, I mean, I, we, I, we've I, had a good conversation here, I think, hmm? and um, I, I don't <laughs> think that either of us are any closer to the other one's view. We've certainly been listening and engaging and going through yeah, all that. No, it, it's been it's been great, and and, and what we're, and, I, and I'm just trying to open you up, man, to like to the <laughs> beauty of the coordinating function, the the, the way you know, the, the a cooperative society of mutual advantage through markets, and property, and liberty. I just well, I'm telling you, Matt, we'll drop some acid, and I'll tell you about the proletariat sometime. It'll be great. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> that, 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 we'll, we'll do that. I'll, put it, I'll, I'll, I'll pencil it in. Uh -huh. uh, um, but you have to find that. I don't, I don't have any idea where one would get such a thing. Sure. I'll tell you the truth. I, I All, right. All right, man. Take care, Thank Ezra, and, and, and I hope you don't think that I think that you're in bad faith in any no, sense. I know, I know I, you don't. I, I'm just telling you that. It, because I don't, but I, but I think it's frustrating. It's hard to actually get people to engage uh, they dismiss you, yeah. it's been, and, and, and it gets. And when you're outside of the political mainstream, it gets frustrating no, because listen, you man, feel like I, you're I'm not about being as close to, to a democratic socialist as you come in America. So, uh, on some level, I feel your pain. All right, all right, buddy. all right. Well, great talking to you, Ezra. Be well.